Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Sachs, and on behalf of Campbell & Company, I would like to welcome you to Looking Ahead in 2021, Emerging Trends in Philanthropy. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly go through some logistics for those of you who may be new to our webinars. Close any programs other than GoToWebinar that are running on your computer. We recommend calling in with a phone instead of using your computer speakers. If you experience visual issues, send a chat to Campbell & Company or contact GoToWebinar at the number on your screen, and that'll be on the next slide. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes, and you'll earn one continuing education credit that is good with your participation with CFRE International. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes information on how to download your certificate. In that same follow-up email, you'll also receive a link to download today's slides along with a link to the recording. We do welcome questions throughout the webinar. Please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the right side of your computer screen. We will hold time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters today, Arthur Affleck, Executive Vice President of the American Alliance of Museums, Stacey Palmer, Editor of the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Christina Yoon, Vice President and Director, East Region of Campbell & Company. Thanks so much, Molly. It's great to be with all of you here today and to welcome our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to each one. So with training in law and higher education, Arthur Affleck has been with the American Alliance of Museums since 2017 and currently serves as Executive Vice President, responsible for leading and managing an array of Alliance programs and services, including membership, development, IT, and meetings and events. Notable achievements include securing seven-figure foundation grants to support facing change. This is the Alliance's groundbreaking diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion initiative. And he's helped achieve 100% board giving during his tenure. I'm excited to hear more about this work during today's discussion. Also, we have Stacey Palmer. She has served as a top editor since the Chronicle of Philanthropy was founded in 1988 and has overseen the development of its website, philanthropy.com. She plays a hands-on role in many Chronicle services, such as its Philanthropy Today daily newsletter and its webinar series offering professional development for people involved in fundraising, grant seeking, advocacy, marketing, and social media. I encourage you to check it out. Both Stacy and Arthur are active members of their communities, serving on boards and lending their professional expertise to help advance the nonprofit sector. Welcome to you both. So before we dig into the trends in philanthropy, I'd like to take a few minutes to ask Stacey then Arthur to each share their high level thoughts and insights about the current moment. I think all of us had a great sense of optimism about turning the page on 2020 and beginning the new year. The availability of the COVID vaccine, a presidential transition, and our collective will to address racial injustice made many of us hopeful about an improvement in our life and our work this year and this year ahead. So first to Stacey, what are your high level thoughts? Thank you for hosting this webinar. And I just want to thank everyone in the audience for your amazing work. This is a hard time to be a nonprofit executive and a fundraiser. You are often on the front lines doing amazingly important work and under great pressure to be able to raise money that keeps things going in this time of enormous need. Um, and so we are just deeply grateful and we under, we've written a lot of articles about the stress everyone is under. Um, and that's the part that I hope will ease um, in the year ahead, not just the financial outlook um, and all of the things that Tina just mentioned. Um, I share the optimism that this year is going to be better. I you know, I think we did not see giving drop as much as we all expected last year. I think that's a good sign. I still think it's challenging and that, you know, the reason I think we both wanted to do this webinar, Arthur and I, is that we see great possibilities, but you have to tap into them. You have to, you know, really be exuberant in your fundraising and aggressive um, and take advantage of this moment. There's great generosity out there, but we all have to think of smart ways to tap into it. Thanks, Stacey. And how about you, Arthur? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you again uh, for joining us today. Um, 
I spent over a decade in nonprofit fundraising and higher education before coming to the American Alliance of Museums. Um, and I can see in this environment, certainly 2020, it has been very challenging um, for uh, the chief development officers. But like, like Stacy, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I believe while it has been for many the worst of times, um, it can be the best of times. Um, and we're here to share with you some trends today that we think will um, be important to helping us to have a better 2020, 2021. So um, let's, let's dive in. That's great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, turn our attention now to the four trends that we've identified that we wanted to talk through with you today. We'll go through each one individually, have some time to discuss these. Um, and then after we've gone through all four, we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A from the audience. And so as we go through these trends, please feel free to drop in questions into the chat and then into the question box, and then um, we'll collect those for the, for the Q&A, um, dedicated Q&A time later. Um, as we go through each of these trends, we will also be posting different references that we looked at as we prepared for today's webinar. And this will provide further reading for all of you. And so we'll put those in the chat throughout our conversation. And we will also share a comprehensive list of all of this, these resources on the slides at the very end for those of our friends who, who are accessing through, um, through a recording and aren't able to see the chat as we go along. OK, so without further ado, let's go to the first trend. So trend number one, nonprofit organizations are navigating unprecedented challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, what an understatement. <laughs> uh, this, this year, uh, the last year was quite something for all the reasons that we are acutely aware of both in our work lives and personal lives at home. In addition, what has been so stunning about this particular trend is that we have witnessed an uneven impact of the pandemic on the nonprofit sector. So for example, Food banks are, are a group of organizations that have experienced a huge surge in giving accompanied with a huge surge in need of constituents and our friends and neighbors. And at the same time, arts and culture organizations have been completely devastated. Um, and Arthur, I'd like to turn to you first. Um, the American Alliance of Museums represents more than 35,000 individual museum professionals and volunteers institutions and corporate partners. Um, how have your members been responding? So we did a survey uh, in October of 2020 of our members. Um, and when I say our members, the Alliance um, supports, we say from A to Z, art museums, to science centers, to arboretums, to natural history museums, to zoos, to um, historic houses, etc. cetera. So um, we have a wide range of sizes and types of institutions. So I think the data in our research will be applicable and certainly um, uh, will, will, uh, you'll appreciate whatever type of nonprofit you're associated with. So a few bullet points from the survey and uh, uh, a link to the survey has been or will be provided. So first of all, um, at some point in 2020, 98%, almost all of our museums were forced to be closed due to COVID. Um, some obviously reopened at some point or another, but at some point, all of them just about were closed. Uh, nearly one third of museum directors surveyed confirmed that there was a significant risk of them permanently closing. And so this is very concerning uh, to us. Uh, also half of our museums, we asked about your financial reserves, half of our members said they only had about six months of or less of operating reserves. So what happens after the seventh and eighth month, you're closed and you're not able to generate revenue. Um, hence, there were certainly a lot of layoffs and furloughs. And so half of the responding museums indicated that they indeed had to furlough um, staff or lay off staff. Uh, and so that's the big challenge. I'll mention one other bullet and, and you can read the rest of the survey. Um, on average, respondents anticipated losing about 30% of the, their operating budget in 2020, but more importantly, they expect to lose almost 30%, 28, 30% in 2021. Uh, so the scenarios are still dire for many of these um, of these these museum uh, members. Thank you. 
Um, Stacy, I am wondering about um, what is your perspective on what's been seen with other types of nonprofits um, across the sector? I know you, your, uh, the Chronicle recently did a cover story about this very topic. Yes, um, you know, obviously one of the big differences with this catastrophe is the fact that we have social distancing and that that changes the operations in both good ways and bad ways. Certainly some groups have been very innovative in how they put their programs online and been able to reach many more people. Um, same is true for fundraising. You know, you certainly see this rise of the democratization of special events. You don't have to be a rich donor anymore sometimes to get access to terrific things. Um, so there have been, you know, some changes that I think were always in the works that have been accelerated, but some groups are taking this moment to go deeper and to rethink their missions entirely. Um, we took a look at one arts organization that does public art that said it's not even sure it wants to keep any of its mission that way anymore, that it's rethinking everything. What is the need for that in this world today? Other groups are, you know, adjusting maybe how they do their work. Um, a group that serves the poor here in DC realized that maybe one of the most efficient things it could do is just give cash directly to its clients. That's an idea that I think we've seen experimented with a lot. There are a lot of donors behind that idea. And one of the things they realized was it might be more efficient, but they also had to grapple with the fact that it meant that if this truly worked, the organization itself might not be needed anymore. Um, you wouldn't have all of these social service professionals involved in doing the work. And they said to themselves, isn't it better if we actually just solve these problems rather than worry about our own existence? So I think that kind of thinking um, you know, about your very existence is going on throughout the nonprofit world. And people have been freed to think about some of the ideas that they never thought would happen. Donors have been captivated by some of those ideas. They like that fresh thinking. Um, so you know, I think there's a real opportunity for a reset and to continue thinking about that. Um, so that's why I'm optimistic about things. Certainly for some groups, however, where that physical engagement is so important, it's very hard to reimagine, you know, how we're going to do things. And so I think, you know, those kinds of groups are really just getting ready for what happens once we're all vaccinated and we can be together again. Yeah. That's right. Um, I think with some groups, it's been tough because um, not only like if you think about like the arts and culture sector where in-person engagement is what it's all about, there have also been lots of um, organizations for whom volunteering is an important part of the way that people engage with that organization. And because of social distancing restrictions, some of those volunteering activities were able to convert to virtual, but some weren't. And so that's been quite a challenge. Um, but we've also been seeing that a lot more people are interested in making wills and, you know, redoing their wills and making bequests and thinking about long-term sustainability for organizations. So that, that has been really exciting. But Arthur, I think that um, you may have some examples from some of your uh, member organizations and even from the AAM itself about relationships you've had with your funders and the kinds of conversations that you've been having about, about um, what does the funding model look like for, for you and for your member organizations. I wonder if you want to share a little bit about that. Sure. So all of us have had to uh, do everything virtual. Um, as a matter of fact, our major annual meetings, um, you know, have had to, to go virtual and many of us generate significant revenue from some of those activities and events. And so, so it's been an interesting uh, challenge. So we um, uh, did that this year and had in 2020 had our first virtual annual meeting. Um, the revenue is not the same as the in-person meeting. Um, the value proposition is not the same for exhibitors and sponsors who are so used to pressing the flesh. Um, as one of my six-figure sponsors said, um, uh, you know, I, I like to walk the halls and, and, and really meet people and engage with people and have people see me and then grab me. So um, uh, we have found that digital fundraising events, um, revenues have fallen about 34% short from the in-person event. So we're having to, to be creative there. Now, the good news is that many of our funders uh, and donors have been responsive uh, and have been willing to contribute more um, to some of these, as Stacy said, creative ways that we are serving our communities. Um, donors have been willing to, to offer flexibility. Um, I can recall getting emails from foundations saying, we are willing to consider, quote, maximum flexibility with our grant. So mm -hmm. if you cannot fully execute on the project, let's talk about how we can be creative and still 
provide some services. And even in some instances, uh, funders have allowed uh, grantees to repurpose some of their grants into general operating funds. Uh, and so if you have not had that conversation with your, your, your grantors and donors, um, certainly foundation donors, that is something that some have been willing to, to do. So it's not all bad news. And the last thing I'll say is that we have learned to be more creative in the digital space and uh, research has shown that for our sector, we're reaching more younger people now because we're doing so many things in the virtual environment. And if we can keep that with our traditional populations, when we open back up, we may even have uh, larger audiences um, to serve and then increased revenue as well. Yeah, I think those are all really great points. They probably resonate with many of the members of our audience, no matter which sector you're in. Some of these things are probably uh, people are agreeing with and nodding their heads. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear about um, donors wanting to provide organizations with that maximum flexibility, that idea. I think that really is a value statement on their part, saying we believe in the services and the missions that you have, and we want to see you survive this pandemic and be there when we can all be back together in person. And so that's so encouraging to hear. Um, I'd like to move us now to the next trend, number two. The pandemic plunged the U.S. into a recession, but what impact may this have on charitable giving? So, you know, the um, Giving USA Foundation conducts research every year um, on charitable giving in the U.S., and over decades of research, what we've seen consistently is that charitable giving is closely tied to the economy, uh, the health of the economy, and it hovers at around 2% of GDP. So at the same time, uh, what we're seeing in this current pandemic is that because of the unequal impact of the pandemic, we know that actually many wealthy individuals are doing quite well and have been able to maintain their commitment to specific causes and missions that they already cared about pre-pandemic, so kind of referring to that values piece. Um, but in some cases, they're able to increase giving in response to this moment and maybe taking on some new charities and causes that they maybe weren't as um, acutely aware of prior, prior to the pandemic. And we've seen that foundations, as Arthur had just mentioned, are making larger unrestricted grants. Um, so Stacy, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what are your views about the recession that we find ourselves in today and what its impact potentially could be on charitable giving? I think you put your finger on what makes this different than other recessions is that we really see this dramatic increase in wealth among the very wealthy and the inequality that so many charities are fighting against. On the fundraising side, it actually means that there are people who have quite a bit of money to give and they are interested in giving it. Um, and so while it's not an ideal way for society that we have this recovery happening with the wealthy doing much, much better than the poor, it is an opportunity for fundraisers um, to tap into. Um, you've probably seen some of these figures that you know are put out pretty much once a month, you know, about the increase in um, the wealth of you know millionaires and billionaires. So there are many people to tap into. Um, they don't necessarily have to be the wealthiest, but the most affluent are doing pretty well. You can see their interest in giving in, you know, a number of people when the stimulus checks were approved and now, you know, in the second round, the number of people who automatically themselves said, I'm giving mine away. You know, I know I don't need it and I am going to give it to somebody else. And they're waiting, you know, some checks were delayed because of bad mail delivery. And I see people saying, but I want to be able to give mine to charity. The charities truly need it. Um, and, you know, that's something that nonprofits can organize and tap into, but that came very spontaneously from a lot of people seeing need and saying, I want to do something about it. We've seen a number of wealthy philanthropists talking about ways that they can help the nonprofits that they care about doing fundraising, you know, reaching out. There's a wonderful philanthropist in Chicago who recognized that there was so much need um, that she and she knew that billboard space wasn't being used anymore because there wasn't as much advertising. So she encouraged um, the local billboard companies to put up ads for charities on every billboard throughout Chicago so people would be reminded of the need to give. Now, those are the kinds of donors who can truly make a difference um, in many ways that go well beyond writing a check. Um, 
Um, and Tina's right, we certainly see in foundations um, a rethinking of what they can do as well. Um, we're really looking to see how long that lasts into the new year. In the past year, they were very generous, um, but their assets have done quite well because most of them are invested in the stock market. So they should be able to give very generously, even if they stick to the 5% payout. And some of them are looking at giving a lot more. Thanks, Stacey. Arthur, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this topic? So I, I want to address the uh, one of the trends we talked about the increased giving to health and human services, but that's not all um, donors are giving to. They're giving to the environment. They're also giving to the arts. And so I want to encourage uh, my colleagues to continue asking. But another trend is um, and shift is a focus on working with existing grantees. Uh, and so if you have a good donor base, foundations, corporations, individuals, um, that's a place to really focus your energies because uh, we find in, in our organization and the research shows that 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 uh, donors are sticking with in large part uh, those organizations that they know and and have supported and certainly foundations want uh, these entities they've been supporting to to survive i'm reminded uh though if we're going to be successful in working with our existing um, um, donors, I'm reminded of, of something Hank Rosso said, founder of the fundraising school at Indy, Indiana University many years ago. I was privileged to, to spend a couple of weeks there. Um, but he said, fundraising is the gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. One of the things we must do with our donors is, is to help them through stewardship, understand and appreciate the value of their gifts and the impact it's having and the difference it's making and help them to feel joyful about supporting and giving. We had this conversation with our board recently, um, and it was a great conversation because several board members stepped up and said, you know, I do feel joy uh, when I'm sharing. And we do have 100% giving on the board because we have a great board, we have a great board chair, we have a great CEO, and, and it matters, it makes a difference. But I want to say that um, this notion of, um, of, of this, this economic, this recession being uh, a problem for giving um, doesn't have to mean that you, you you have fewer donations. With individual donors, I'll just make this last point, we have found going and, and tapping into our individual donor base that we've been able to upgrade donors there. And then with the help of, some, of certain board members walking us to some of our friends that we didn't even know had capacity to help us at a different level, we got six-figure gifts from individuals that we never would have thought to even ask for that kind of support. So this is a time um, you know, there used to be when we were learning the keyboard years ago for computers, we used to we used to, to, to learn it with the saying, now is the time for all good men and women to come to the aid of their country. That was something we practiced. Now is the time for all board members and volunteers and friends and everyone to help their nonprofit by reaching out to your networks um, and introduce, introducing those people to the CEO or to the chief development officer. And so ask your people to help you by connecting you to warm prospects and you'll you'll make a difference that'll that'll make a difference. Thank you so much, Arthur. I was just uh, giggling to myself, realizing we are recording this. You can feel free to share this recording with some of your your volunteers for those of you who are staff members at your organizations. Um, but I did want to just thank Arthur for um, for bringing up this idea of stewardship of donors. Um, I think that we saw that when the pandemic first hit last spring, well, when the stay-at-home orders really went into effect, that a lot of organizations were quite stunned. Like, what do we do now? We are so used to like getting that next visit, but now what are we supposed to do? We're all stuck in our homes. And um, you know, our advice at that time, and it's still our advice today, is to really double down on stewardship. Make sure that you are staying in touch with your donors, even just like a courtesy call to see how they're doing is welcome and helpful for your long-term cultivation efforts. Um, for some organizations where you haven't actually been start, haven't started that up yet and have not been interacting that much with your donors, either by phone or video, I encourage you to start right now. It's not too late. And as we can see from the vaccine rollout, it's going to take some time before really we get back to the same level of interaction and engagement that we were used to um, at the beginning of 2020. So. Um, I'd like to move now to trend number three. So, giving to racial justice causes soared amid widespread protests against police brutality and increased attention on the Black Lives Matter movement. So here, I'm sure that many of you have heard references to 2020 being the year of the double pandemic. 
of the coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter movement. And many donors are stepping up to the challenge of giving more to Black-led organizations and those organizations focused on equity and racial justice and realizing that before now, they haven't really been doing nearly enough and it's time to change. So we've been very encouraged by this. Even within Campbell and Company, we had lots of discussions about what is our response to this call. Many of us are going through our own journeys of personal um, awareness and understanding and, and then now asking what can we do. But um, you know, I was so excited about Arthur um, being able to spend time with us today because he's been involved with a really special diversity and inclusion initiative with his members at AAM. So I'd like to give him a moment now to talk about, talk about that. Sure, so uh, veteran fundraisers know that funders don't and donors don't give because you have needs, they give because you meet needs. And so a number of years ago, AAM leadership identified a great need in our sector for help with diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. And we put together a working group of members from the field of experts to, to study the problem. And we came up with a statement of work where we thought we could help uh, our field nationally. Um, we also, and that was, and we also in 2016, we're not new to this work, put in our strategic plan that a focus area in our, in, in our work would be diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. In 2017, the theme of our annual meeting was diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. So in 2018, when we went to funders to say, will you help us um, to mount a national program uh, to advance um, museum board diversity and inclusion, they were open to the conversation because we had skin in the game, we had demonstrated the value proposition, um, we demonstrated our commitment, and so uh, we received um, uh, a significant uh, $4 million grant from three foundations, um, the Ford Foundation, Mellon and the Alice Walton Foundation, wonderful funders that have been partnering with us for the past three years on this work. And, uh, and, and it's, it's a board diversity and inclusion initiative working with boards in five cities. Uh, we work with thousands of board members and trustees, uh, training and assessing uh, and helping these museums work up um, uh, 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 diversity and inclusion plans. And we've actually placed dozens and dozens of diverse board members onto these boards that would not have been there without this work. Now we understand that with these board members and with this diverse leadership, the community will be better served because these board members will help raise those issues and will help um, the director and the leaders of these institutions understand the issues in their community so they can uh, serve those. So we were thrilled and pleased, but I wanted to make the point that you can't wait for funding sometimes. You have to dig in, you have to start. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when you identify a challenge and a problem and you have to be authentic. Uh, and we were authentic in our approach because again, we didn't decide how to do this work on our own. We brought in diverse leaders from the Latinx community, from the African-American community, other communities to say, what are the needs? What are the issues? How can we help? And uh, we'll have a great report at the end of this year of the, the value that we've added to those institutions. And so we're thrilled to, to have, have done that. And now we're getting calls from some other funders who are wondering about, we're thinking now about anti-racism work in museums very specifically. And we're looking at how we can help the field to address that honestly, uh, again, so that they can um, expand on the work already done with the foundational diversity and inclusion work. Yeah, thank you so much, Arthur. I think that a lot of what you described are similar challenges no matter which field you're actually in. So um, I think that provides a nice model. And, and it was like a proof of concept, the fact that you, know, you're, you have this new program now, but that it's limited, right? You only have a certain number of museums that you could actually work with on this initiative, right. but the demand is so much greater. So I think that that is like your proof of concept, this work must continue and this program should be expanded. I'm sure that's true. Yes, we can't meet the sector. demand. If funders are on the call, we, we do need more resources to advance this work. Thank yes. you very much. Exactly. So um, Stacey, I wanted to talk, have, have you comment on, you know, this is not just at the board level that we're talking about. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about where dollars are going and how donors are responding. Yeah, it's been phenomenal. Certainly, um, you know, the Candid has estimated that at least as much has gone into racial equity giving from foundations and corporations, you know, this year at, 
well, in, over the past year, um, as in the previous 12 years that they've been recording it. I mean, it just was phenomenal how much money was flowing. Corporations started very quickly um, giving money. Foundations are also putting a lot of money into this. And we've also seen a rise in the number of individual donors who are also giving. And I would say, you know, it's a very diverse group of donors that is giving. You see white donors stepping in to give to historically black colleges and universities in very big numbers, for example. Um, and you've also seen um, a lot of people of color saying, this is the time for me to make my most generous gift. I, I really wanna make sure that attention is fixated on this issue for a long time. Everyone knows that attention spans sometimes do not last as long as we want them to. And you know, you see a real interest in establishing more permanent institutions um, that will carry on this work. And so that's what many donors have tried to respond to. Um, many donors are looking at the composition of the organization itself, very interested in making sure that they are supporting groups that are led by people of color. Um, that's why the board work that Arthur is doing is so important. You know, there's the look at the staff and the board um, and a recognition that groups have not done as well um, as they probably should. And many groups are working on that. Um, but it is something that's very, very important to many donors. We're also seeing people look at that on their fundraising teams. Who are the people who are reaching out? Um, and what can we do to make sure that there are more people of color who are influencing the fundraising strategy um, as well as the ask? Because clearly people give for so many different reasons and making sure that we're thinking hard about all of that. So I think those things are going to be lasting um, in our organizations. Um, and I see continued interest in it um, really from every side of the spectrum. The needs, however, are vast, just like with everything else. While there's a lot of dollars flowing in, um, there's been a long period of time where it's been proven that groups led by people of color do not get as much foundation and corporate support as other organizations. So, you know, there's a big gap to be filled. So while we can applaud the generosity we're seeing now, there still needs to be much more of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Stacey. That was a very complete answer. And, um, but I did want to also just make a comment about Campbell and Company as a consulting firm. We are also seeing uh, requests and sometimes demands from our potential clients Show us who the people are that are serving this project, that would serve this project. We want to see that it matches, you know, the, the constituency we're serving, the work that we're trying to invest, the folks that we bring on as our consulting partners also are paying attention to this as well. So it's a good, it's a challenge for us too. Um, and finally, we've seen a trend with our clients paying more attention to what does the donor population look like? And, uh, and even like the people that they engage through their work, what does that look like as well? So, you know, we, you know, especially like maybe one example might be like in the environmental sector. Um, traditionally thought of as like older white people that really care about these issues, but it turns out, no, it's not the case. Younger folks do, people of color, even people in urban areas. There are lots of um, issues related to justice and equity that, apply to people of color and to issues of conservation and are incredibly important. And so these organizations that we partner with are all recognizing, I mean, they've been recognizing and that they're feeling it all the more now that we have to pay attention to who it is we're engaging, both as constituents and as donors. And we want that to be um, as diverse and inclusive as possible. So I'd finally like to move to our fourth trend and this one is the community centric fundraising movement is gaining steam and challenging the fundraising status quo. So one of the uh, interesting developments in 2020 was the launch of the community centric fundraising movement. And um, I'm just going to give a definition from their organization about what community centric fundraising is. It's a fundraising model that is grounded in equity and social justice. It prioritizes the entire community over individual organizations. It fosters a sense of belonging and interdependence. It presents its work not as individual transactions, but holistically, and it encourages mutual support between nonprofits. And now there's a whole website you could go to and to dig into more about what this means. But what is so um, interesting about the community-centric fundraising movement is that it really puts the idea of donor-centric fundraising on its head. And it's forcing all of us to reconsider the power structures and dynamics that have traditionally been in place. And so this includes, whom do we recruit to serve on our boards and what is their role? 
how do we engage donors in the work beyond the gift itself, beyond that financial payment? Um, what language do we use in our communication? How do we, and how, how do we steward our donors? So in short, um, how can we do work differently to make it more inclusive and promote the value of community? And I'd love maybe to start with Stacy to, to talk a little bit about this topic and provide your input and thoughts. Yeah, this is a really interesting movement that, you know, is taking off in some ways. It goes back to the roots, you know, really that much of fundraising has had. Um, but I think, you know, there are some people who think you have to choose either sort of a donor centric approach or a community centric approach. And then other people who say it really is about both. And part of it is to educate donors about what the true needs are and in some ways to help talk to them about preventing problems. Um, we ran an op-ed and there's a link to it that you'll see um, that from a hospital fundraiser who said, you know, obviously part of what they raise money for all the time is charity care. We're used to understanding that that's something that's important. But now what they're doing is educating their donors also about the need for prevention in some of the communities, especially those that have been hard hit by COVID that we've all seen, um, to look at how people of color have been disproportionately affected and what kinds of things can be done to make sure that we don't have those same problems ingrained. Many donors might not have known how to deal with that problem. Um, they may have come to the hospital because they cared deeply about, you know, they were treated well or, you know, for a family member got over an ailment, but they're very interested. They want to hear the message. And that kind of thinking about sort of expanding what donors are thinking about, especially in this moment, as people are thinking about these things, is working very well. Um, one of the other ideas she shared that I thought was really interesting is to borrow an idea that college endowments, you know, always add a bit to when they're when they're negotiating a gift, you know, to say some of the money goes into our cost to make sure we maintain some of this over time. Well, how about adding in a little bit for racial equity efforts um, and let donors know, it, be, be transparent about it. But, you know, that that's sort of the cost of doing business, that that speaks to the values of who we are as a nonprofit and to try to think about those things in different ways. So I think we're seeing a lot of creativity um, in rethinking how we do fundraising and really a great deal of receptiveness from donors to this kind of new thinking. Great. Thanks so much, Stacey. Arthur, what do you have to add to this topic? So, uh, Stacey, that was an excellent, excellent answer. The, the, the thing I would add is um, the thought occurred to me when she was speaking, you know, sometimes you have not because you ask not. Um, there are donors who still have this donor-centric approach but are open to a community-centric approach, but we uh, have to bring it to them and help them understand how mm -hmm. what they have proposed in trying to help us won't really help us. And we have to be with respect, <laughs> um, you know, talk to them and push back. And so one of the things that I've enjoyed, um, uh, th this pandemic has created a compassionate quotient, if you will, a compassionate uh, 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 donor community that's that's been open to more listening. We've had more conversations with our major donors in 2020 than we, 2020 than we've had in many years, and 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 they're listening. And so um, I just want to encourage this our community, nonprofit community, to talk to your individual donors, talk to your foundation program officers. Um, they are really willing to listen and to reshape in in some instances um, proposals that that would have gone a different way if you hadn't helped them understand this would really be best for our community. This would really be best for our organization. If you really want to help us, can we shape it this way? And we have we have found that many are open to that conversation because they, they want to have success. They, they just have a habit of approaching it a certain way. So I think this movement is here to stay, but I think we have to help it along by advocating for ourselves and our communities uh, and articulately sharing that information uh, so that funders uh, can appreciate it and hopefully make some adjustments. I love um, your point, Arthur, about how it is a conversation. This is one of those principles of um, a fundraising that we're working on with all of our clients all the time is for it to be a dialogue, um, for you to understand what motivates that donor, what are they trying to accomplish with their gift, and at the same time, what is your organization trying to do? Uh, and what kind of mission are they trying to fulfill? What's the vision? And where do those intersect? And so it's important to really come to that understanding and that can only happen through conversation. So I really love that. The other aspect too that I'm thinking about is how, you know, this, we, we stated this all throughout. 
this pandemic has really done a number on us. It is new, it's different, it's unique, and we're all trying to figure it out together. And so I like this idea of working together with a donor to co-create a solution. And so, um, so that sounds great. Um, I would actually like to turn this over to, um, our, to my colleague, Molly Sachs, who will lead us through the Q&A portion of the discussion. We'll spend about 10 minutes here, and then we will close up with some wrapping, uh, wrapping, wrap up comments and thoughts. Um, so Molly, how, how is the chat looking with the questions for us? Thanks, Tina. Um, we are, we do have some questions in the queue, and I encourage anyone who, you know, thinks of other questions as um, we're talking to just continue to send them on in and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, so our first question, um, a tool that regained popularity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the renewed focus on racial justice was the Mutual Aid Fund. How do you see this tool progressing in the future? Is it around to stay? Will nonprofits adapt to them, or do you think they'll lose popularity? So is there um, either of you would like to take a stab at this one to start us off? I think there are a lot of people who would like to see foundations watch what's going on with mutual aid and use that same kind of approach, and that it really is you know, a way of thinking about needs in a community, letting the people who are in need set more of the agenda, um, and that it it probably will reshape relationships. You know, I think one of the things we've seen happening for a while, the pandemic accelerated it, is, you know, people are giving outside of traditional charities. You know, it's so much easier to have a GoFundMe page or do other things that don't need to be in a formal charity network. Um, and that's what a lot of this mutual aid group are. It's both volunteering and setting it, but it's, it's very informal kind of giving. It's very, you get a lot of gratitude because you know who you're helping um, in many ways um, and it's more local. Those are the things that I think donors have been calling for for a while. Um, and it's, that's part of what's leading to greater generosity. So I think if people you know, listen to the strengths of that movement, it is going to last for a long time. Um, and it, it means for traditional 501c3s thinking about things a little bit differently as well as from foundations and other donors, um, but it's worth following that. So I, I am optimistic that it will continue. Um, one comment I'll add to that is I think it's important when we think about charitable giving generally and broadly, you know, some of that is captured, as I mentioned, through the Giving USA uh, research that's done, but that is somewhat restricted in the fact that it wouldn't capture some of these other ways of giving, like as, as Stacey has also mentioned. And so um, I think that's a good challenge for those of us who want to consider broadly about what philanthropy is and what role it plays in our society and how do we measure it and, and analyze and um, understand what motivates it and what makes it grow over time. And so I um, just wanted to offer up that comment. Arthur, did you have, you don't necessarily have to, but um, should we, do you have any other no, we thoughts? No, we can go to the next question, thanks. Great, okay, Molly. Great, next question. In a couple of brief words, what are the panelists' ideas on the state of higher education fundraising, and what should colleges do to pivot to be successful during this time? Great. So, um, so I, ahead, yeah, Arthur, do you want to start us off? No, go ahead, go ahead Tina. Okay, and I'm hearing a little bit of static on my end. I hope my sound is okay. Um, so in higher ed, you know, it's been quite a crisis um, for institutions because of the, you know, the difficulties with gathering students together on campus in person. And, um, and it also has caused a crisis within the fundraising teams with um, how do you reach out to your alumni base, your source of best, you know, your best donors, um, when you no longer have these opportunities to engage in person. And what we've seen, there's, there has been a lot of creativity brought into engaging alumni and constituents with, with the universities. Um, and one interesting trend has been that typically, like in alumni engagement um, departments within a university, those folks that, uh, that helped to organize the events really thought of themselves more as like event planners because that's what their work was organized around. But we're seeing that because everything's going virtual, there's a shift now where those folks are now becoming more like um, 
volunteer, uh, they more like have a volunteer portfolio of volunteers that they help manage and engage in ways that can really strengthen their ties to the university and ultimately lead to greater giving. But, you know, it is a, a way of continuing to strengthen the ties and build up, build up the community. So I think that's a very interesting trend. And so for higher ed, um, you know, there, there is also the role that higher ed can play in, um, in leading forward on thoughts, the research, you know, these uh, understanding the social implications of the times that we face today. And so for folks to be investing in that kind of scholarship work is important. And also for trying to make the ability to access college, an affordable college education, that's also another piece that I think is even more um, resonant with people today, that, uh, that to be able to provide those kinds of opportunities uh, makes for a very compelling case. Yeah. Okay, Molly, next question. Tina, we are getting a little bit of static from you, so you might want to um, switch to your speakerphone or um, switch up your, your audio there. Okay. But I will go ahead and move on to our next question. Given the new administration's changing emphasis around taxes, um, the economy, et cetera, how do you see that influencing giving in 2021? Okay, so um, this is Tina. I actually didn't hear the question, and I think I might have an issue with my audio, so maybe can I just lob it to Arthur or Stacy, and hopefully you feel comfortable responding while I figure this out. Stacey, you want to take yeah, I'm happy to, you know, the question is about tax policy um, and, you know, how it's going to be different. There are a lot of efforts um, really at every level, you know, both to extend the charitable deduction, which I think we all know, you know, um, was extended in the CARES Act so that people, even if they don't itemize, can deduct up to $300 for a single person, $600 for um, a couple. Nonprofits are lobbying very hard to extend that, saying that it was very successful um, and really made a difference on those lower end gifts. And we really saw, I mean, that was one of the, well, we talked a lot about the role that the most affluent have played during this webinar. The really important thing to recognize is that some of the increases in giving um, over the past year were absolutely coming from very small donors. And the thinking is that it was in part being able to talk about the tax deduction um, and that offer. So that's something that, you know, Congress is expected to continue, um, whether there'll be a push for more. Then at the very highest level, um, some wealthy donors and foundations are putting pressure on Congress to say, force everybody to give more, especially the wealthy. We actually want rules that tell us that we have to pay out more from our donor advised funds, from our foundation endowments. Now that's really unusual. You don't usually see um, the very wealthiest people in society saying, please force our hand. We, we want to give more. But I think there's a feeling among some um, that their peers aren't doing as much as they can afford to do. And they feel like congressional legislation is a good idea. We've heard some rumors that this may be moving fast, um, and you'll probably start hearing that word reconciliation a lot. Um, that's a congressional act that can move things quickly. If you start seeing that happening, it means things are going to move fast. Be in touch with your lawmaker if you're interested in these things, and let them know what kinds of things are really important to you to increase charitable giving. Mm -hmm. uh, Tina, just let me just jump in quickly because I think the last thing Stacy said makes so much sense that we don't think about. These things don't happen organically. Every year, um, uh, AAM has a Museums Advocacy Day where we convene members from around the country and we actually uh, go up on Capitol Hill um, and meet with every House and Senate office and talk about the importance of our community to their states, to their cities, and, and talk about tax policy, talk about um, um, uh, uh, government support. And I think all nonprofits, we need to, to have this charitable deduction increased. We need to, to have better tax policy to support nonprofits, but we have to advocate and push for it. And so I hope all of us will, will do that collectively and then we'll see better tax policy that will support nonprofits. Molly, do we have time for one more question? I think we do. This one is about community-centric fundraising. Um, you spoke about the need for a dialogue with foundation program officers and high-level donors when you spoke of the community-centric fundraising trend, but what recommendations do you have for general communications with individual donors? 
Um, so I could start off, uh, and hopefully the sound is good. If you could thumbs up, okay. So, um, so I think that that's an important point that um, that the pandemic has really helped because there are more ways in which you can reach out to broader audiences, and you aren't really restricted by geography anymore. If, especially if you're an organization that that does work nationally, you can. You have opportunities to engage um, people all over no matter where they live and you can engage people from all levels you know we had reference to that earlier in our discussion about not necessarily needing to have a high price ticket um, event but can make it more equitable from that point of view um, our video tools have enabled us to have more um, discussions that have been more equitable and have been more inclusive because they've been able to engage more people. And, um, and finally, I think it's the language that we use in our general donor communications and to be able to send it out through social media and, um, and also through other written communications that, that these are your opportunities to send a broad message to explain um, the ways in which people can get involved, not just the ones who may previously have been thought of to have access because they are the ones making the big gifts. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for those questions. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your, um, your engagement in this discussion. Um, we wanted to close out with some thoughts about looking ahead to the future. And, um, you know, with vaccines now available, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what should we do to keep moving forward? So I'd like to start with Arthur and ask, uh, what advice do you have um, for nonprofits and what is your outlook for the second half, uh, for, for the rest of this year? Sure. So again, thank you for this conversation, Stacy and Christina. This has been great. Uh, so first and foremost, um, you know, drive change, have impact. Um, you know, for example, if your organization is called, if you call yourself Save the Whales, every once in a while you have to save a whale. Uh, so have impact, but you have to communicate that impact. Don't assume people know that you've been doing this great work, nor they may not know why it's important to save all these whales. So you gotta do the work, you gotta communicate, you gotta let people know why it's important um, and steward these gifts and then you'll have uh, success. My outlook, I think 2021 is going to be um, in the first part of 2021 as we get vaccines in arms will continue to be difficult. Many of our institutions will continue to be closed. Uh, we'll continue to have to support them. Uh, hopefully near the end of 2021, um, things will start uh, opening up and we can um, generate more revenue and, and get to a new normal, uh, but, um, but be in a position to generate some revenue to move our institutions um, forward. But I am optimistic that if we do the things that we've talked about today, that we will have the success that we seek to serve our communities. Great, thank you, Arthur. And how about you, Stacey? Um, I agree with what Arthur said, and I, I think the important thing, too, is that we need to start talking about what are the things that we've learned that are working and that we want to keep, even though this has been an awful time and none of us would have wished to learn these lessons. The pandemic's been tough, but there are so many things I think that people are doing differently that I think we would all like to see happen. Um, I think rethinking special events has been an important thing. It's relieved some of the stress um, that some organizations have to put all of their focus in that instead of um, and building real relationships with donors. Uh, I think we've all found that work from home and some of that flexibility, while I am very eager to go back and see my colleagues, um, I think all of them feel that we'd like to maybe have part-time work at home and part-time work in the office. I think fundraising teams are gonna be restructured in many ways um, and that we should build on that flexibility. And I'll say one thing I'm especially concerned about and I, we devoted our cover to it um, in the, first issue in January was really, you know, the role of women in the field. This pandemic has been especially tough on women, um, in part because of their childcare responsibilities, with schools being closed, that has been very tough, especially on them. They're also the first to be laid off in many cases. So we need to make sure that we start a career path that really works for women or else we're gonna lose some of the best people in this field. Um, and fundraising in particular tends to be a fairly female dominated uh, world as does the nonprofit world. So I think all organizations need to start paying attention to, you know, what are the things that have set us back 
um, and really make sure to give opportunities to everyone. So I'd urge people to think about, you know, sort of what's been lost and what can we gain going forward? Because we are going to be back. Um, you know, I hope in our offices and seeing each other soon. Um, but, but let's make sure we keep some of the things that we've learned and gained as well. Yeah, I think one of the uh, themes for 2021 is hybrid. <laughs> you know, doing a hybrid of what we had pre-pandemic and what we learned during 2020 and um, picking out the best of both worlds, applying them in the most strategic ways possible and uh, and just being flexible. I mean, I, I, it's kind of amazing for me as a consultant, uh, and I think my colleagues agree with me, we used to spend a lot of time on the road. And I know that's true for like road warrior, uh, major gift officers. And even like if you have a national board and like all folks like flying in to one location three times a year, you know, to try to have these in-person conversations. And I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, take anything away from the value of those in-person conversations, but I do believe that the days of getting on a plane and traveling the whole day to see someone for 30 minutes and then <laughs> turning around and getting right back on that plane so you can go sleep in your own bed <laughs> that night, that those days are probably over and I think we'll all be better off for it. Um, and so I look forward to, you know, figuring that out together with my colleagues and with our clients and, uh, and helping you also think about what does that mean for donor engagement and what can we pick and choose from? And I just think it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a mix of both. And, um, and I am optimistic about, um, about what's coming in 2021. It's uh, most, from most of the conversations I'm having with clients that most of them are kind of thinking, as Arthur says, first half of 2021, kind of like more of the same. But as we go into the fall, you know, some of the arts and culture clients, they're starting to, they're planning seasons like for plays and such planning in-person engagement and seasons in the fall. I heard Dr. Fauci say that we can have a full theater as long as we still wear masks, you know? So I'm excited about all those things for, for the sector as a whole. And for me personally, you know, I'm sure all of us are feeling kind of weary with, with everything that's been going on and we're ready, you know, we are ready to get back. Um, maybe the handshake is gone though. You know, the business handshake when you meet someone, maybe it'll just always be a fist bump or an elbow, elbow touch. But, um, but anyways, just, just want to, end this conversation on a hopeful note and say that we are optimistic and, uh, and know that we can work together and bring our creativity to bear on, on the challenges of our time. Um, I wanted to share with you as promised, these are the references. I'm just gonna keep them up here for a short time. Um, I have two pages of these. You know, some of our folks who are accessing this content through a recorded uh, version of the webinar, will not have seen these um, shared in the chat, so I wanted to be sure that we flash them up here so that they can take a look. The slides will also be available for those of you who'd rather just take them from there. And uh, we just wanna thank you so much. Um, you know, as I said, uh, it's been challenging, and but we brought our creativity and it's provided a great intellectual challenge, which I always appreciate and always happy to have partners and really appreciate the time of Arthur and Stacy for both of you to spend your, your knowledge and your, your time with us to share your knowledge and your expertise and your insight and wisdom gained from many years of working and um, being devoted to the sector. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Molly now to close us out. Thanks, Tina. And yes, thank you all so much for joining us and Arthur and Stacy as well. Um, everyone, please look out for our email with the webinar recording and the slides and get in touch with us if you have questions. We encourage you to sign up for future Campbell and Company webinars. Next up is making a fundraising ask on Zoom and that'll be on February 3rd. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.